This piece is called The Existential Crisis We Face, Passing Through and Surmounting It. Now, the existential crisis we face is the possibility of an entire collapse of human civilization on this planet through various causes that include climate destabilization, that is, the shifts of climate that affect our agriculture, affect our infrastructure, affect the integrity of entire countries, economic systems, health systems. You get the gist of it. What we're facing is a convergence of situations that threatens collapse of the entire basis of our civilization. Think massive starvation, mass migrations, gigantic amounts of crime, wars, including the most extreme possibility of war. That's the existential crisis we're facing. Surmounting means to be bigger than and to overcome, being bigger than and overcoming. I'm going to start here with the dictionary definitions of surmounting so that you get a little bit of a boost in listening to the rest of this. Surmounting, to overcome, as in a difficulty or obstacle, to conquer, to get over, to prevail over, to triumph over, to get the better of, to beat, to vanquish, to master, to clear, to get past or around or over something, to be unstoppable by something, to deal with something, to cope with something. You get the idea. The opposite of to surmount is to be beaten by. What's coming in this piece is an overview of some essentials that are needed to surmount the existential crisis that we are presently facing. What's needed to overcome it? What's in the way of overcoming it? Clearing what's in the way? First steps and self-help for navigating these unavoidable, impending, turbulent times. What's essential is a series of reconfigurations, reconfigurations meaning changing the intended results of our actions, both in terms of individual life and in terms of larger policy, government policy. Changing the intended results of our actions and changing how we cause those results. In other words, new directions. So that's what I mean by reconfiguration. The measures I'm about to talk about are far more than any one individual can accomplish. And in hearing them, you may feel a sense of overwhelm. No big surprise. In hearing what's in this piece, you'll understand why certain political candidates for the presidency have these measures in their plans once elected. Some of them are very well focused. I suggest you listen to them and elect those because if you think to elect a moderate who will not undertake the radical changes that are needed, it won't matter who gets elected, we're going down. In other words, we have to be all in and that means putting everything we've got on the line, betting the whole pack of resources we've got. Okay, the essentials, reconfigurations, education, health care, environmental protection, circulation of wealth, 
and politics, reconfiguring politics. Now I'm going to say more about each of those. Education. Education is the means by which a civilization is passed from generation to generation. It's more than the know-how, more than the technology. It's also entire sets of values, individual capacities, and by capacities I mean faculties of intelligence, ability, initiative, ethics, general responsibility, maturity. Education covers all of those and all of those are essential to the passing of a civilization from generation to generation. So that was education. Healthcare. The ability of people to work depends upon their health. The ability of people to create depends upon their health. The ability of people to meet challenges depends upon their health. We currently have an approach to health in which we do as we damn please, do as we saw our parents do or see others in society do without really much intelligent regard for the consequences to our health. When someone falls sick, they go to a medical system, the mainstream medical system, which is built upon stopping symptoms, treating the illnesses that have already occurred. It's basically an emergency medical system. It's not a system that has a strong hand in cultivating health. Yes, there is health cultivation in some measure, even in the Western allopathic medical system, but face it, it's minor. And it doesn't make a dent in people's intelligence to be told that diet makes a difference, exercise makes a difference, because People have learned to indulge themselves and then to tolerate the consequences. Well, in facing an existential crisis, that will not do. And those who follow the old habits will go down first. Particularly as the system breaks down and the medical system becomes overwhelmed. The first inklings of this we see in the coronavirus epidemic. If you just pay attention to the news, I don't need to say more. So I've touched on health care. You need to be healthy in order to carry on the business of a civilization. Environmental protection. This popular term seems to be insufficiently understood by people particularly in big business who place short-term profitability in a first priority position over balancing the effects of business with its effect on the environment that sustains us and the, our environment is what sustains agriculture. You like to eat better pay attention to the effects on our environment. It's the basis of our health. Healthy environment, there is the possibility of maintaining and enhancing health. Unhealthy environment, we're going down. Think mass starvation, epidemics, and basically the crash of the health status of entire populations. That's my brief overview on environmental protection. You can find plenty more elsewhere in the mass media and online. Circulation of wealth. Money, like blood, functions by circulating, not by pooling. When you get a pooling of wealth, 
what happens is you get, in effect, a deficiency of wealth in the rest of a society, and all kinds of problems ensue. And I'm going to say more about that shortly. Right now, I'm just touching upon this as an area that must be handled to surmount the existential crisis into which we have already entered. Fair politics. The words honesty and transparency exist in the public conversation about politics, but we don't see it much in politics. It seems to be some sort of acceptable struggle to get transparency in governments. It seems to be some sort of privilege or some sort of idealistic accomplishment. It's not. It's essential. Think, if you're married, how important transparency between you and your spouse and between you and your children is. If you don't have transparency, all kinds of trouble can develop. The mere tendency of people to be less than transparent indicates an intent to hide things must not be permitted. In fair politics, we would expect to see a service orientation. Instead, we see a self-service orientation. Guess what happens to the circulation of wealth in a self-service orientation? And the ensuing consequences on public health and on the intelligence of a population and the ability to transmit the civilization from generation to generation when the government is engaged in a self-service orientation rather than public service. So, what's in the way? Starting with wealth, what happens when wealth pools? Well, if we use the metaphor of the body, that is, the similarity, using the body as a way of understanding it, when money, like blood, doesn't circulate properly, let's use the physiological or bodily metaphor, when blood doesn't circulate properly, there's a vulnerability to clotting. Now, in a social structure, clotting shows up as the unworkability of social systems, including the economy, and breakdown. So, when wealth pools, we end up with a kind of obesity. And in a society, we get the appearance of fat cats, also known as the 1%. In the general economy, we see sluggishness, loss of ability to function, heightened stress levels, and social blindness which shows up as an out-of-touch and self-serving government. The parallel to a diabetes is obvious. Diabetic gets sluggish. They lose ability to function. They're under heightened stress, and they can lose nerve function, showing up as blindness and pain. Pooling of wealth leads to chronic diseases, just as pooling of blood and pooling of bodily resources in fat leads to chronic conditions. In social terms, we see poverty and hunger. In a diabetic, we see things like diabetic shock, fainting, possible death. In a society, the form of shock that we see is crime and wars. Wars and crime are results of pooling of wealth. Another thing that's in the way, it's a big one, is lazy complacency. The idea that it hasn't hit yet. Well folks, it has hit. If you're paying any attention to the news or paying any attention to what's being published on YouTube, you'll see that these existential 
manifestations of crisis are already hitting. Things like flooding in Italy, in Venice, in the Philippines, mass migrations of refugees running either from the consequences of climate shifts as we're seeing in Africa and in Central America, outbreaks of disease, it's all obvious. If you pay any attention at all, you see it has already hit. Another thing that's in the way is a lack of imagination on the part of probably nearly everyone about how things could be better than they are. That is, it's a lot easier to stay with the way things are because it's known, whereas a change due to a reconfiguration of how we operate in the society puts us in the face of unknowns, many of them. The problem of memory dominating imagination is a fault of our educational system, which prizes memory way more than imagination. In business, imagination has its place, but even that is limited. Here's an obvious example. An earlier innovator uh, in the previous century, Nikola Tesla, developed technologies that vastly outstrip what has been allowed to be developed today. People in business who want to keep their wealth put blocks in the way of developments that would change the flow of wealth away from them. This goes along with pooling of wealth and uh, bad circulation of wealth through the economy. So people prefer the known, the status quo, over the unknown. In particular, the unknown that would result from big reconfigurations of how things operate in this society. The reconfiguration means changing of the rules and changing of the results. How do those words make you feel? So people feel more at home with the status quo than with the idea of a massive reconfiguration. And there are candidates for president who have been talking about exactly that massive reconfiguration. And people call that radical and they're afraid of it without really paying attention to what will happen if we don't do that. This is a kind of intellectual laziness and a kind of blind complacency. That blind complacency has allowed the election of politicians to high office who are engaged in policies that benefit themselves and that create massive problems for the most of the population. There's a saying, the biggest problem could have been solved when it was small. Think about that for a moment. Look at our present situation. The problems are mounting. If we had had the initiative and intelligence, the personal responsibility to deal with these conditions before they became big, they would never have gotten so extreme. So what's necessary for the reconfiguration to clear up what's in the way is to exercise foresight. Foresight requires imagination. Foresight generally builds upon knowledge or what we remember and then extends it into the unknown through imagination. Anything new is unknown when it first emerges and it emerges always through imagination. Convenient example, Albert Einstein's thought experiments by which he discovered relativity, which in turn changed our entire world view about how things operate. Now I will say that it has not changed the world view uniformly among all people. A large bulk of the population still think of one cause producing one effect, which is the Newtonian view of mechanics. Einstein's view recognized 
that the world is comprised of incalculable relationships that summate together to produce visible effects. The leading advances in technology build upon that view. The problems of our economy have to do with the failure to recognize the interrelationship of things and so in capitalism people think they have the right just to make as much money as they can without any responsibility for the effects on our living environment or upon social dynamics. They think the rules of capitalism are anything goes as long as it's legal or can be legally defended. Well, this is a lack of foresight. Think of what Exxon Mobil has done in their pre-existing knowledge that a fossil fuel energy economy would lead to climate destabilization. But they were small-minded. All they cared about was the profits and they didn't take into account the larger effects. So now we've got an already destabilized climate. This is a squashing on their part of both insight and conscience. So we need foresight and foresight requires imagination. So the clearing of the thing that's in the way is to cultivate and reward foresight not to suppress foresight. Once imagination is sufficiently activated, it, we can use it to bootstrap or to prepare for and to initiate an appetite for reconfiguration. Got to have an appetite for reconfiguration, whereas people generally avoid reconfiguration until a crisis is upon them. This is a case where the biggest problem could have been solved when it was small, but people were complacent and irresponsible, in denial, and suppressing imagination, suppressing the implications of what they imagined, which we call foresight, and so have allowed this mass of problems to mount upon us. Education then must be reconfigured and expanded to cultivate imagination equally with memory, equally. What's been cut back in education are the humanities and the arts. In other words, the entire domain of imagination. A very stupid move basically a move that serves entrenched wealth based on the idea that education's purpose is to create a workforce for a person to learn a trade. Well, yeah, that's necessary, but certainly not sufficient. Imagination must be cultivated to meet the challenges that we're facing. Reconfiguration of health care. Health care, as I've said, is basically emergency medicine. It's to handle the consequences of incompetent health management. So, healthcare must be reconfigured to emphasize health maintenance versus treatment of diseases. The term HMO, Health Maintenance Organization, is the right term, but the wrong actions. Health maintenance organizations are no more again than emergency medicine. As I said before, yes, there's some mention of diet and exercise, but for the most part, that's what we call the unfavored stepsister. Reconfiguring health care would lighten the financial burden on society that bad health produces in a society. Reconfiguring health care towards health cultivation reduces the need for drugs. Reconfiguring health care to emphasize health cultivation 
would improve the vital capacity that we have to meet the challenges of this existential crisis. Returning pooled wealth into circulation. Now we've heard about a 2% tax on the ultra-rich. That's one aspect. Another is removing subsidies from particularly from industries that don't really need them such as the oil industry removing favored treatment from the pharmaceutical industry those are examples you can exercise your own intelligence about further applications further ways of returning wealth into circulation all of this would fulfill the promise of trickle-down theory which has been proven to be a bogus theory with no predictive power basically because it depends upon the largesse of the wealthy that is to say their generosity in allowing the wealth to trickle down rather than having the wealth pool into their own private reserves this requires a value change this value change has a name, socialism. We're seeing it in various Scandinavian countries presently, where the well-being of the population is placed before the well-being of individual businesses. What's happened with socialism that gave it a bad name is that people like Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell got into the control position relative to circulation of wealth and turn socialism into self-service while still calling it socialism. So socialism became closely associated in people's minds with communism, which by the way was also perverted by self-seeking, self-serving people in power. That's how they got their bad name. Not because the systems are bad, but because those systems were hijacked. They were hijacked by people like Donald Trump and most of the billionaire class with a few exceptions generous billionaires whose philanthropy has benefited the world who have different values set than the one percent who merely pool wealth into their own private reserves in what I call an abuse of capitalism Returning pooled wealth into circulation would also reduce drug abuse because much if not most of drug abuse is actually self-medication to ameliorate the effects of stress produced by poverty, economic anxiety. Returning pooled wealth into circulation would also reduce the incidence of stress-induced disorders. In other words, mental health problems, depression, suicide. It's not the money that has those beneficial effects, but the circulation of it so that the problems of chronic financial deficiency, the effects are reduced and the anxieties and stress go down. It's not a result of a consumer society where everybody's after the latest Cadillac or Mercedes or whatever or the fancy watch or even the latest high-tech devices it has to do with solving the problems of economic anxiety not self-indulgence up the wazoo so what's necessary to clear these problems also involves or essentially involves expelling those in the power structure anywhere in the world who obstruct truth and right action who obstruct truth and right action look to the government of the United States right now expelling those in the power structure who obstruct truth and right action stripping control from their hands through both conventional means such as elections or prosecutions and unconventional means such as personal ostracism ostracism is cutting people off 
from the social flow. This is something that I heard of happening with regard to people who are backing Donald Trump who couldn't get a date in Washington, D.C. That's one simple form of ostracism. It's basically cutting people off from the social order. Boycotts. That means removing support from companies who damage the public good. The promotion of healthy values and the denigration or putting down of unhealthy or counterproductive values through the social media and entertainment media as well as through personal contact, personal relationships. That all said, sounds pretty overwhelming, doesn't it? However, there is an easy fix for that, which is take things step by step, one at a time. Put your attention on imagining each of the clearing steps that I've stated. And you may use the notes to which I'm referring in this piece so that you can easily see what those steps are. We need a new public consensus. We need to confront holdouts. We need to confront and undermine people who are supporting those who need to be expelled from the power structure. We need to use means equally forceful, equally ruthless if necessary, to those that those in the power structure who are keeping things on a danger path in place in the status quo. So we need to confront the holdouts, undermine them through things like personal ostracism, confrontations, boycotts, and through promotion of healthy values through the social media and the entertainment media. We need then to redirect our resources, which include attention, and the flow of money as I referred to boycotting and ostracism. Finally, we need to create communications that extend the reach of this video. This video will be seen by some small number of people, but if it triggers ideas in you or creative impulses, put those ideas into tangible existence. Create your own media create forms that can go viral. I want to conclude with a definition of insanity. You've heard something similar, but I'm going to tell you something else. What you've heard is insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. I don't think that's insanity. I think that's stupidity. My definition of insanity is habitually resorting to what is unwholesome or disturbing to avoid facing actual conditions. Habitually resorting to what is unwholesome or disturbing. That's insanity. A few words for the wise is sufficient. The ostrich that puts its head in the sand to avoid facing danger gets eaten. Here's a link to resources for restoring emotional balance so that you can function more intelligently. Stress impairs intelligence. This is a way of restoring emotional balance. I've published it freely for free use because that's what the public needs right now. People need superior means for recovering their emotional balance so that they can intelligently function. I'm Lawrence Gold.